All right, greetings everyone. In this video, we're going to explore how to determine if there is chamber enlargement on the 12 lead EKG. So we're going to look at atrial enlargement and ventricular enlargement, all the rules needed to interpret those things. So let's take a look at atrial enlargement. Atrial enlargement, of course, we have two atrium, and therefore we can look at right atrial enlargement and we can look at left atrial enlargement. And of course, each has its respective set of rules for interpretation. So let's take a look first at right atrial enlargement. This is also known as P. pulmonal, and the reason for that is typically this is a pulmonary problem that causes P wave changes. And P. pulmonal, simply put, uh, is a P wave whose amplitude exceeds 2.5 millimeters of elevation. So amplitude 2.5 millimeters. It also tends to take on a TP or a tent appearance. So it tends to look something like this. All right? It tends to take this very uh, peaked shape and again its amplitude exceeds two and a half millimeters tall. All right? So that's kind of important. P. pulmonal. Simple rules. All right, let's take a look at left atrial enlargement. Left atrial enlargement also referred to as P. mitral and this is often due to P wave changes often due to mitral valve stenosis. So as that mitral valve uh, that stenotic mitral valve causes the atrial tissue above it, the left atrium, to have to work harder to overcome the pressures inside the left atrium. That P wave tends to assume a very specific shape. Um, by the way, something I forgot to mention here was that this 2.5 millimeters of amplitude is in lead 2. All right, so let's take a look now in left atrial enlargement. In lead two, what you would get is a P wave that kind of looks like this. It's an M shape, and you'll see that it has two distinct peaks, and it kind of looks like a little M wave. The right-sided peak tends to be taller than the left-sided peak, and the reason for that we'll explain in just a second. And also the P wave tends to get a little bit wider. We're looking at a duration of 110 milliseconds or more. So... These are the changes associated with lead 2, and in V1, what we end up seeing is that the P wave is greater than 1 millimeter deep. So you'll get something that looks like this in lead V1, where that represents the P wave. This is the early depolarization. This is the right atrial depolarization component, and then the left atrial depolarization component. All right, so let's take a look at what happens here. Unfortunately, the EKG can't separate two simultaneous electrical events into two separate electrical uh, graphs on the paper. So it has to sum those events together. So essentially what you're looking at here is this first component here is representative of the right atrium depolarizing. Well, because the left atrium is enlarged or there's a delay in getting that depolarization, instead of depolarizing near simultaneously, there's a delay in start, all right, represented by a delay here across the x-axis. And this next component that you see then represents the left atrium. So both of these guys are still doing their thing. Uh, right atrium goes first, the left atrium follows, but it's delayed. And so the, the overall P wave duration exceeds the normal. And in fact, you get this prolongation to about greater than 110 milliseconds. Also, because there's a little bit more muscle mass or there, there's more tissue, we also get a change in the amplitude and you uh, see that, you appreciate that in lead V1. So this m shape appearance, p mitral, left atrial enlargement, what you also notice in some of the rule books is that the peak-to-peak -peak difference here has to be greater than 40 milliseconds in duration, meaning that there's a delay between the start of right atrial depolarization and left atrial depolarization to the tune of greater than 40 milliseconds. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at this. Uh, I won't waste a lot of time showing EKG examples of this. Um, remember that the tests, the EKG testing for atrial and ventricular enlargement or hypertrophy is highly specific but extremely insensitive. So diagnosis of right atrial changes uh, in terms of, of uh, size or right or left ventricular hypertrophy is accomplished by way of echo and not by EKG because the EKG is an extremely insensitive tool for this uh, for these changes. All right, so these are the general rules, but remember it, ha it lacks sensitivity.
All right, this is from our colleagues over at Life in the Fast Lane, Mike Cadigan and, uh, and colleagues. Um, and uh, this is a great chart that kind of summarizes the changes that can take place with res respect to the P wave and, uh, and right or left atrial enlargement or biatrial enlargement. So let's talk through this very quickly. Normal P wave, remember you'll see lead 2 and V1. These are the best leads to view atrial activity in. Normal P wave is a nice upright rounded P wave. It tends to be less than 110 milliseconds in duration. And again here, it tends to be less than one millimeter tall or one millimeter deep in lead V1. You get a biphasic wave. Uh, that's a result of the right then the left atrium that's, uh, that's depolarizing there. In right atrial enlargement, the right atrium fires first. Therefore, you get this right peak that takes place on this graph. And it's followed by a uh, lesser tall peak, which represents the then depolarization of the left ventricle, I'm sorry, the left atrium. Uh, so right atrial enlargement, you get an increase in the amplitude. Remember we said that increase tends to be greater than two and a half millimeters in amplitude. You get this peaked shape appearance, all right, with right atrial enlargement. And again, in right atrial enlargement, the piece that increases here in lead V1, this is the contribution of the right atrium. This is this early uh, portion of the P wave. All right, in left atrial enlargement, left side, Again, we have here, this is where the right atrium is depolarizing, followed uh, shortly thereafter by the left. Remember that the peak-to-peak -peak difference is greater than 40 milliseconds. This is also known as P mitral. It looks like an M shape. And it is a wide or a prolonged duration P wave greater than 110 milliseconds. And then in lead V1, you tend to get this uh, this terminal portion of the P wave, the terminal portion of this biphasic wave here, tends to exceed one millimeter in depth. And then, of course, if you combine both of these, you can have biatrial enlargement. You kind of get uh, the best of uh, both worlds, if you want to look at it that way. You get an increase in amplitude overall, plus an increase in duration overall, and that's because of the respective contributions of the right and left atrial enlargement components, and then therefore you also see amplitude changes, uh, shape changes of the P wave in V1, and then a depth that exceeds one millimeter in lead V1. So this is a great little chart to summarize um, all of the changes that are associated with that. So now let's talk uh, briefly about left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular enlargement. I'm going to use the term, uh, the terms interchangeably. Uh, clearly they are not. Sometimes the, uh, the right ventricle, for example, can dilate because it's under excessive pressure. It could be due to pulmonary hypertension. It could be due to uh, increased pressure secondary to a large pulmonary embolism. So lots of things that can cause dilation or enlargement. And then hypertrophy, of course, we're talking about an increase in muscle mass. And that could be physiologic or pathological Unfortunately, we can't tell the difference between a physiologic LVH and a pathologic LVH just from the EKG. So remember the EKG testing here for ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, these are insensitive tests. They're highly specific, but they're extremely low um, uh, sensitivity. All right, so let's explore some of the rules here. So let's start out with right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy. We're going to say for right ventricular hypertrophy, the really, really first important thing we got to do is look at the QRS complex. It must be of normal duration. If we have a QRS complex that exceeds 120 milliseconds, then what we're looking at is most likely right bundle branch block. But in this case, right ventricular hypertrophy has a normal duration QRS complex. And in lead V1, the R wave tends to be greater than 7 millimeters in amplitude. All right, so if you look at the EKG, it's got a normal duration QRS complex and it's got these big tall R waves in lead V1, then we're going to say that that's, uh, that's likely to be right ventricular hypertrophy. There are a tremendous amount of additional rules that you can apply to this that increase the sensitivity a little bit to this test, but again, they remain pretty insensitive, so I won't uh, belabor the point. Normal duration QRS complex, tall R waves, think right ventricular hypertrophy. Let's take a look at the left side, left ventricular hypertrophy. I'm going to present two and only two rules. Uh, 
for interpretation of LVH. There are probably 15 or 18 of them that you can remember, and they get kind of confusing. So uh, instead of worrying about that, let's look at the two that I believe to be the most commonly encountered. And then remember, LVH is diagnosed by echo, not by EKG. So the first one I want to mention to you is looking at the limb leads or the augmented voltage leads. We're going to look at lead AVL and we're going to look for an R wave that exceeds 11 millimeters in amplitude. Now there's a caveat to this and the caveat is there must be a normal axis in order for you to use this rule. If the axis is left axis deviation then the R wave has to be taller than 13 millimeters. All right, so that's the first rule. Second rule that you can apply is uh, a rule where you're going to look in leads V1 and V2, and you're going to find the deepest est wave. All right, and you're going to measure that. So you're going to take the deepest S wave, and you're going to measure it. And then you're going to look in V5 and V6, and you're going to look for the tallest R wave and you're going to measure that and then you're going to add the two things together so the measurement the depth of the deepest s wave in v1 and v2 or v2 plus the tallest r wave in v5 or v6 if that number exceeds 35 millimeters we say that the ekg meets the voltage criteria for lvh all right so let's take a look at those in practice and let's see if we can apply some of those rules so this is the first EKG tracing we're looking at here. Just off the bat, we notice, man, there's a lot of, uh, there. most of these leads, it looks like the R wave and the S wave are pretty similar. All right, so that, that jumps out at me when I first look at this EKG tracing. So next thing I want to go to here is I'm going to go to lead V1, and I'm going to examine this QRS complex. And I'm going to notice, in fact, that the QRS complex is of normal duration. So the QRS is less than 120 milliseconds. It's probably about two small boxes. Let's put it at 80. And if I look at this QRS complex, normally the QRS complex in lead V1 should look something like this, where I have a little R wave and a deep S. Instead here, what I have is a really, really, really prominent R wave. So I have an R wave that exceeds about seven millimeters of amplitude. And these two findings, normal duration QRS complex, and an R wave that exceeds seven millimeters, we should be thinking right ventricular hypertrophy. All right, let's move on to the next guy. Next guy, we're gonna look at this tracing. The bottom portion of this is exactly the same as the top portion. It's just that I've blown up lead AVL so that we can examine it a little bit more closely. All right, so when you look at this EKG tracing, there are two things that really jump out at you. The first thing that jumps out at me is this really tall QRS complex in lead one, and then this really tall complex in lead AVL. Right. Now, something else that you'll notice here is that if you look at one in AVF, you'll notice that AVF is predominantly negative. And so I presented just a few moments ago in the previous slide or two, we were taking a look at this and we said that in order to apply the rule of an R wave greater than 11 millimeters as voltage criteria for LVH, it had to have a normal axis. But if we have left axis deviation, we have to change this threshold a little bit. Let's go back to our example and see if we need to, uh, to change our threshold here. So if you look at lead one, we have a positive upright lead one and we have a negatively deflected AVF. This is conclusive for left axis deviation. So now we're going to go to our AVL. Let's go and count our R wave here. So we're going to start about here, and we're going to end it right at the peak here. It kind of overlaps the S wave from lead AVR above it. So we're going to kind of count there. Let's just go by 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and here we have an extra one. So we're at about 15 millimeters. So the R wave is about 15 millimeters. That certainly meets the threshold. We're going to call this the uh, that the EKG meets the voltage criteria for LVH. All right, so we're going to call this voltage criteria for uh, for LVH. Remember, we can't say definitively that the patient has LVH. What we're going to say is that the EKG meets the voltage criteria for LVH. So the first rule is take a look at your R wave and AVL. 
establish whether or not there's left axis deviation. In the absence of left axis deviation, measure the R wave in AVL. If it exceeds 11 millimeters, we're going to call it voltage criteria for LVH. If the presence of left axis deviation is revealed on the EKG, then we're going to go for an R wave greater than 13 millimeters, and in this case, this meets that criterion. Let's take a look at another example. The next example is from a 21-year-old patient, and we're going to take a look and we're going to recall that we're going to look for V1 and V2, we're going to look for V5 and V6, we're going to find the deepest S, the tallest R, we're going to add them together, and the rule was, is it greater than 35 millimeters, that sum. So again, take a look at leads V1 and V2 here. I have blown them up so that you can see them a little bit more clearly. I believe V2 is probably the deepest here. Let's, uh, let's take a look. I think V2's S wave ends there. It starts about here. So let's call this 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So the S here is 30 millimeters in depth. S wave 30. And now we're going to look at V5 and V6. I think V5 is the tallest R wave. We'll start it about here. We'll end it about there. Let's call this 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, and add another 3 or 4. Let's just call this 20 millimeters, the R wave. So in fact, if we take the S plus the R, we end up with 50 millimeters, and that certainly meets the voltage criteria for LVH. All right, so same thing. We're going to say this particular rule here meets the voltage criteria for LVH. All right, and that's all there is to it for chamber enlargement.